Hello and welcome to Press TV's News Analysis coming to you from Tehran. I'm Marzi Hashimi. Thanks so much for being with us. The biggest one day loss for American soldiers in Afghanistan as dozens of elite forces have been killed when their helicopter was shot down by the Taliban. This year has seen an increase in civilian deaths in Afghanistan as well as U.S.-led troops. Now, if the U.S. has not been able to bring security to Afghanistan in almost a decade of being there, then what is the purpose of Washington remaining there? As more body bags return to the states, an increased number of Americans are demanding an end to the war. The new U.S. Secretary of Defense has responded to the fatal day for his soldiers by saying the United States will stay the course in Afghanistan. The deadliest day for U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Dozens of American commandos have died in a Taliban attack. Nearly 300 American soldiers have already been killed in Afghanistan in 2011. But the war has been costly, both in terms of loss of lives and taxpayer dollars. The United States has spent hundreds of billions of dollars during the decade-long war in Afghanistan. The U.S. military is to spend some $113 billion more in the current fiscal year. It comes against a backdrop of fresh recession fears sparked by a debt crisis in the United States. An international think tank has said the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan has failed, despite billions of dollars spent. After a decade of major security, development and humanitarian assistance, the international community has failed to achieve a politically stable and economically viable Afghanistan. More than 1,700 American soldiers have lost their lives in the unpopular war in Afghanistan, leaving thousands of mothers and fathers bereaved. When you walk in, it still smells like Brian. And I have to remind myself that he's really gone, that he'll never be coming back. Many are now asking, has the war been worth the lost lives and dollars, and how long it is going to last? It seems like such a waste. It, it sure seems to be that to us right now. that that it's hard to uh, stand and justify, one, why it's going on, uh, two, why it's going on so long. I'd like to welcome my guests uh, to the program. Uh, from uh, Kabul, political analyst Mr. Harun Mir. From uh, Berkeley, California, in the U.S., the foreign policy in focus, Mr. Khan Hallinan. And uh, from uh, London, independent filmmaker and political analyst, Mr. Sukhan Chandan. Thank you all for being with us. Let me start it off uh, with you in Kabul. Now, Mr. Mir, why is the U.S., in your perspective, still in Afghanistan? Well, uh, we don't consider uh, this as a failure. Uh, certainly, it's uh, uh, a difficult war for the United States. But uh, I think the United States started this war on wrong assumptions. Uh, the first uh, mistake was to believe that Pakistan is an ally on this war. And secondly, the United States did not invest on the Afghan capacity initially. And it uh, took at least uh, six to seven years before President Obama decided to invest on the Afghan security forces. So we wasted, I think, uh, uh, six or seven years. And now I think uh, we want to correct these assumptions and redirect the war. And this is the reason why the focus is uh, on the Afghan transition, is to build the capacity of Afghan forces and to make sure that the Afghans will take charge of the conflict in Afghanistan. And this is what we Afghans have been demanding from uh, day one. But unfortunately, our input was not that much considered in policy making in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere in major NATO capitals. 
Okay, well, let me turn to the U.S. and uh, get Mr. Hallinan in on this. What's your take on that when you hear Mr. Muir say that, well, six years was wasted? Uh, we're talking about, obviously, American lives, U.S.-led lives, and, of course, Afghan civilian lives. Um, do you think that your country should continue to remain in Afghanistan? No, I think the war is a disaster, and I think it's been a disaster from the beginning. I think you must remember that the original reason why the United States went into Afghanistan was really not because 9-11, because there weren't any Afghans involved in the attack on the World Trade Center and the, and the Pentagon. The reason why they went in there was that it set the stage for the eventual uh, invasion of Iraq, and that was the basic idea. Now, one of the reasons why the United States stays in in Afghanistan is that Afghanistan still is uh, strategically a very important country. It, it really is the, the crossroads into South Asia, into the Middle East, into uh, Western Asia, into, uh, cent to, into Central Asia, etc. So the United States has um, strategic interests in that area. As far as the war itself goes, the war has continued to go downhill. Um, not only have civilian casualties gone up and American casualties gone up, but the fact of the matter is, is that the current strategy of assassinating the Taliban leadership is actually making the situation worse. Because what we're doing is we're getting rid of the older, more experienced Taliban leaders, and, and, and the, the baton is passing, passing to much younger and more fundamentalist and more radical sections of the Taliban. There has to be a political settlement. Who are we going to talk to? This, this war has been a catastrophe from the beginning. And one other thing, too, is that I think it probably is the beginning of the end for the uh, North American Treaty Organization. Okay. Uh, what about you, Mr. Chand? And uh, what's your perspective on this? Why uh, do you think that uh, Washington still remains in Afghanistan? And why haven't they been able to bring security to the country in almost a decade? Mm -hmm. I'd like to start off with a quote from Ronald Reagan vis-a-vis uh, -vis Afghanistan. He said, to watch the courageous Afghan freedom fighters battle modern arsenals with simple handheld weapons is an inspiration to those who love freedom. Their courage teaches us a great lesson that there are things in this world worth defending. Now, of course, he was talking about the, uh, the interest for US hegemony across the world. But what happened today in Afghanistan and what's been happening with the national resistance, which is the Taliban, is a resistance against the, uh, against the shock and awe, the full spectrum dominance that the United States and the, its hegemonic interests try to establish across the world. What the Taliban have done, they have resisted successfully in classic popular guerrilla tactics against the greatest military bullying force in the world, which is NATO. When the Americans and NATO went into Afghanistan, they thought they could intimidate the whole world with their so-called shock and awe and full spectrum dominance. But what happened, because of the Second Intifada, because of the Afghan resistance, which is uh, under the leadership of the Taliban, the Taliban are not my you know, ideological bedfellows, but nevertheless, they are the only national resistance there. And because of the resistance in Iraq, what we are seeing now is we're moving away from the era of uh, a US and Western offensive that's being resisted but is not succeeding to an era of victories against US hegemony and Western hegemony. And indicative of that was the 2006 Hezbollah victory against the Zionist state. And today, it's Gaddafi's resistance and the Libyan people's resistance against NATO, where the NATO uh, campaign against Libya is in a complete debacle. But now NATO is on the doorsteps of Syria. The Russian envoy to, uh, to NATO has expressed this just yesterday. So really, after the Intifada, after Iraq, after Af Afghanistan, after US hegemonic, in, uh, hegemonic interest to surround Iraq and Iran, as your previous guest said correctly, but also missing out the, the crucial C word, uh, encircling and trying to bring to heel China. That is also what these wars are about. We are seeing now NATO and the West in a complete military and economic debacle and morass. And really now it's time for the global south to unite, to see the bigger picture, to see what's happening in Syria is an attack on Palestine. If Libya fell, Algeria would have been next and Syria would have been next. If Syria falls, Hezbollah will be next and Palestine will be next and Iran will be embroiled with it. We really have to step back and see what's going on and not fall for the nonsense coming out of some of the mainstream media, including 
including Al Jazeera, which seems to have more the interests of US and Israeli hegemonic interests in the region than it does the resistance uh, uh, positions of our people. Well, oh, Mr. Mir, you're sitting in Afghanistan. Now, what's your take on what our previous speaker, uh, Mr. Chandan, has said? Uh, and also Mr. Hallinan, who said that this is going to be the end of NATO. And uh, also they're saying that uh, the picture is much bigger than it appears. It's a lot more complicated than it appears with the uh, U.S.-led forces in Afghanistan. Your take on that, sir? I have, uh, with due respect for your guest, uh, I totally disagree with them. We in Afghanistan, we have left to conflict for the past three decades. So every day, Afghans are falling, either Afghan soldiers or, or civilians. So we don't consider NATO as an invading force or NATO as an occupying force. We consider NATO as a, liber uh, as, uh, as a liberator force because we have to remember Afghanistan under the Taliban ruling. And, uh, and at least uh, we have tremendous achievements since 2001. But the conflict continues in Afghanistan. It is not because simply the Taliban are uh, uh, freedom fighters. Uh, we have Pakistan behind the Taliban. We have the charities that are coming from all the Gulf countries and, uh, and they are supporting Taliban. We have all these anti-American elements that they want to take their revenge in Afghanistan. They are, they are supporting the Taliban. But uh, the Afghan people, uh, they want uh, democracy in Afghanistan. Democracy is functioning. We had two presidential elections. We had two parliamentary elections. The war is difficult. Uh, we uh, fully understand it. And uh, uh, we uh, are sure that we would achieve the Afghan people support the international mission in Iran. Uh, the difficulties will be removed. We certainly criticize the way the, the war is conducted in Afghanistan, and we Afghans from day one ask for more responsibility. We fought the uh, former Soviet uh, regime in Afghanistan. We defeated the, the, the former Soviet uh, regime and, and the, the Red Army. We are capable of taking control of our own country, but NATO uh, uh, did not allow us from the beginning. And now I think we are in the right track. With the transition going on, if we are able to take full transition by 2014, I think there is enough capacity in Afghanistan, enough political will in Afghanistan uh, to defend our country by ourselves. But uh, we need the support of the international community for uh, uh, some time because we need to uh, rebuild a viable economy for Afghanistan, which is very important. We need to rebuild our society because the Afghan society uh, is very much fragmented because of three decades of conflict. And I think we don't consider, uh, uh, certainly there are a lot of, of these uh, 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 controversial uh, uh, theories that are going on in the region and they consider um, America well, and well, the rest of NATO in, here, uh, in war you against about, Islamic countries, but we don't believe here. in these theories. Let me jump in here. You talk about controversial theories. Uh, do you think, are your people safer today than they were 10 years ago prior to the U.S. Uh, invading the country. We have this year so far in 2011 uh, the largest fatality rate for Afghan civilians. So if you could expand on that, how do you see that uh, you're progressing in your country? Yes, indeed. We have been progressing since 2001. In two I, I, I was in, uh, in Kabul. I was fighting the Taliban myself. And, and, and so the life was very difficult, not in terms of only casualties, but also in terms of living conditions. Living conditions were very difficult, very harsh during the Taliban time. But we have tremendous achievements. You have to travel to Afghanistan to, to, to uh, visit Kabul and other cities, uh, the, especially the Afghan youth, the, the younger generation. They have access to education. Healthcare is, is reaching almost uh, far away villages in Afghanistan and uh, we have other achievements our economy is, 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 is growing very fast and we are we have hope that that we could live among uh, our uh, uh, neighbors uh, in, in the, the rest of, of the, the the world uh, at least uh, as, as a respected nation which during the Taliban time we didn't have the, during the Taliban time our economy was based on on, on, on narco traffic okay. So, uh, All right. Let me let me get have, Mr. Holland and uh, I'm sorry. The other We're... sectors that are emerging. All right. Let me get Mr. Holland in on this. Uh, well, what's your take, Mr. Holland? You're an American. Uh, Mr. Muir says that the United States has been a liberating force in that country. Um, your take on this? 
Well, if they were liberating force, then they would have liberated the country, and the country's not liberated. And I think what you have to do is to take the next step, which is that just recently, about a month ago, the Taliban reissued a, uh, a peace proposal, which was originally proposed back at the end of 2008 or early 2009. And it, it called for uh, cutting ties with uh, al-Qaeda, which are perfectly willing to do. The Taliban is not the same as al-Qaeda. Uh, they're a local organization. Uh, they also called for withdrawal of foreign troops, but not a specific timetable. In fact, the, 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 the term that they used just last week was that the United States could set the timetable, but that they did want to guarantee that there would be no bases left in the United States. Now, this has been an ongoing position on the part of the Taliban, of which the Americans and NATO have never picked up on. There has to be a political solution to the war. The last nationwide polls in Afghanistan indicated that a large majority of Afghans realized there has to be a political settlement, that there has to be even a coalition government. In other words, I don't want the Taliban to take over. I don't think they are going to take over. But they are going to have to be part of whatever emerges from this. So why are we still fighting? If that's the end game, and the United States, at least in public, says that's the end game. Why are we continuing these night raids? Why are we continuing this offensive in the South? Why are we continuing the drone war in Pakistan? And why, why the do you think that, let political. me pose the same question the that you're is, asking, Mr. Holland, and why do you think that that is the case? Okay. Well, I think that there are two reasons. I think, first of all, there is a division of the House. Um, the military, the U.S. military, doesn't want this to be a wasted war. They want to be able to claim that they pressured the Taliban into negotiating, okay? That's not going to happen. So the military is pressing on its own. There are other people in the American government. Remember, the government does not talk with one voice in the United States. There are other people who believe that that whole question of the strategic role of Afghanistan in Central Asia is very important. And my colleague in London is absolutely correct. A good deal of this has to do with China and has to do with, uh, with Iran and uh, shipping energy supplies to China. So this is part of that. All of those things are in play there. And uh, there isn't just one kind of thing. but. Basically, the Obama administration has said there has to be a negotiated end to this. We can't have a military victory. So the question I put to them is, they've got this peace proposal. It's on the table. Why don't you sit down and start talking about it? Call a ceasefire. That's the first thing you do. Call a ceasefire. Stand in place and begin the negotiations now. Okay. I think there is a possibility of a diplomatic end to this All war. right. Well, your perspective, Mr. Chandan, why doesn't the U.S. at this point in time, we see that uh, Saturday was the deadliest day for U.S. troops in that country. Why wouldn't they, as Mr. Uh, Handelin has just suggested, try to arrange a ceasefire and then continue to talk, as many are saying now in Washington, that there's not a military solution to the situation in Afghanistan. When, when the United States and Britain have, such, have so demonized an enemy like the Taliban through their media, amongst uh, their public, it's going to be some time before there's any kind of ceasefire process in negotiating with the Afghan resistance, uh, national resistance, which is, which is the Taliban. But it's very clear in the, the press, the mainstream press of the West, that there is a clear admission, and clearly in the BBC um, news as well, they're clearly admitting they cannot win in Afghanistan, that they essentially have lost. And we know that there's senior Taliban people who have come to London on the condition that they have no public meetings uh, in negotiating with the British and with the Americans and with NATO some kind of uh, defeat for the NATO occupation. This is exactly what's happening. The Taliban, and you know, um, God bless our ancestors, and God please uh, forgive our ancestors that there are still people today who are welcoming in the crusaders, who are welcoming in the colonizers. How many hundreds of years ago did the British decimate Afghanistan and decimate, um, which was India then, which is today Pakistan, and my own land, Punjab as well? We don't forget this. And the, the, you know, the, as they say in Africa, the leopard doesn't change its spots. 
The, the neo-colonialists today, NATO does not change its uh, spots. It's not interested in, 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 in our liberation of any sort. It's interested in domination and conducting that domination through state terror. That's what's going on. Taliban are a very sophisticated national resistance movement. When the NATO attack on Libya was about to happen, the Taliban made a statement only stating, no criticism of Gaddafi, saying this is yet another NATO attack on a Muslim state. And Gaddafi, for his part, a few weeks ago made a speech where he said his people's resistance against NATO is defending Syria and Iran as well. And this is what we need. We need a unity of the global south. We need clarity of the peoples of the global south and their supporters to understand what's going on. We are living through the last days of the empire, the last days of the economic empire and the military empire. In these last days, we don't know what NATO are going to pull out the hat. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fearing NATO is looking for a de-escalation in Afghanistan to free up its troops to attack Syria. This is what the Russian uh, envoy to NATO has said, and, it's, uh, and what, the, what the Russian NATO to envoy said is re reminiscent of what Castro said on the first day of the counter-revolutionary pro-NATO protests in Libya, when he said NATO is coming from for Libya. So, so really, we have to see what exactly is, is, is going on here. We have to listen to our Russian friends, listen to our Libyan friends, and unite once again, like we did in the non-aligned movement of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and 80s. If Libya fell, Libya is the shield of Africa. If Libya fell, who do you think they're going to go after next? Algeria. Who are they going to go after Algeria? South Africa. With Julius Malema, the new revolutionary leader of the youth, of the youth League of the ANC, empire and the Western press is going crazy calling him a new Mugabe. And the South Africans know that they are the next targets as well for the West. We have to be careful. These are the last days of the empire. But in the last days, our vigilance has to grow. Our unity has to grow. And in this, we are slightly lacking. We are seeing too many of our people fall for the tricks of NATO in relation to Libya and Syria and others. We have to maintain vigilance, sister. Okay, what do you mean by the tricks? We're, we're almost out of time because I just want to finish up with what we're talking about in Afghanistan and in general, the connection with everything else. What do you mean by falling, the people are falling with the tricks uh, of NATO? 30 seconds, please. What? Sure, what's happening in Libya? Some people are calling the, the, the Libyan counter-revolutionary pro-NATO rebels revolutionaries. They're not. These people have invited NATO to bomb their own country. Too many people are supporting the protests in Syria, which are clearly has a Saudi, Zionist, and right-wing Lebanese, and empire agenda behind it. So really, we, we should really think critically, step back, look at the bigger picture, and actually foil and sabotage the conspiracies and the plans of US hegemony and NATO uh, aggression. Okay, and I'd like to thank all my guests uh, for this program. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, from Kabul, political analyst Mr. Harun Amir, from Berkeley, California, Foreign Policy and Focus, Mr. Khan Hallinan, and from London, independent filmmaker and political analyst, Mr. Sukant Chandan. Thank you all for being with us. And as always, viewers, I'd like to thank you for being with us in another program of our news analysis. Make sure you join us here, same time, same place tomorrow, as we take a look at one of tomorrow's top headline stories. Well, I'm Marzia Hashimi, signing out for myself and all the crew here in Tehran, thank you so much for being with us, and goodbye.